All right, let's uh, take our seats and get going for the last session this afternoon. Uh, unfortunate role of standing between us and the happy hour, but uh, I think it's going to be an interesting talk. I'm, uh, I'm hoping uh, this talk will put the D back into drones. Uh, Michael Franklin, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to give a talk about, uh, well, I titled it Tiny Ubiquitous, Ubiquitous Machines Powered by D. Uh, it's really about using D to program ARM Cortex M microcontrollers. Uh, my name is Michael Franklin. I'm kind of new to the D crowd. Uh, last year at the closing keynote, Andre had this thing to say. Many users in embedded systems, they use whatever the, the platform offers sort of in hatred. They hate it, but they use it because there's nothing else. We want those folks. I'm one of those folks. <laughs> All right. So um, a little bit about my perspective. I think this is relevant because uh, it'll, it'll kind of uh, describe my approach to uh, programming these microcontrollers. Um, I have a BS in computer engineering. I was trained in C and C++. I probably did an equal amount of uh, VHDL uh, in the university as well. Um, I, uh, after I got out of college, I did about 10 years programming in, uh, programming business applications in C Sharp. And I remember uh, when I was programming, uh, doing a lot of programming in C Sharp, I kind of missed some of the power and the performance of, of C++ and C. And uh, especially when I started uh, programming um, HMIs in, uh, for, well, what was it, Windows CE in the, the .NET Compact Framework, there were a lot of limitations there. And I always found myself p-invoking down into uh, either the Win32 library or um, making my own uh, C and C++ uh, DLLs that I could, uh, I could call from C Sharp in order to, to get the performance and the power that I needed. Uh, two years ago, however, my company, the company I work for, had a bit of a change in business strategy, and uh, they reallocated me to do uh, ARM Cortex M um, firmware development for uh, the indus industrial automation. Um, I have to tell you, uh, my employer is not pursuing D. I'm I'm here on my own interest and my own initiative. Um, I began a project in December of 2013, uh, about six months ago, uh, trying to, to uh, program ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers in just pure D, no C, nothing. Um, so I'm a little bit new to D, and I haven't been doing this for very long, uh, but uh, uh, I'm very excited about it, and I think it'll be a, an interesting project for D, and I hope I'll, I'll have something uh, very significant to show. Okay, so in this particular talk, um, I'm going to give a quick introduction to microcontrollers. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the products and inventions that people are, are uh, using micro, microcontrollers for, uh, some of the tools for writing uh, microcontroller software, and then I'll try to get, give a detailed overview of what I've done so far in order to uh, allow programming these uh, microcontrollers in D. So what is a microcontroller? Well, it's really just a system on a chip. Uh, but it has an emphasis. Well, let me talk about that system on a chip term. It gets kind of tossed around a little bit. Uh, for example, uh, some people might call a CPU and a GPU on one chip a system on a chip. That's a bit of an understatement, or that's a bit of an overstatement. Um, we'll take a look at one of these chips, and you'll really see what a system on a chip is all about. Uh, the emphasis is on uh, interfacing to the physical world. So uh, they typically come with uh, all kinds of peripherals for analog and digital inputs, uh, for reading temperature sensors. You might have an accelerometer, gyro, touchscreen, etc. Uh, analog and digital outputs for those those things mentioned there: relays, solenoids, LEDs, motors, actuators, audio, graphics. They even have um, LCD controllers built into these microcontrollers now, so you can do simple 2D graphics. And then, of course, communication. Uh, it's, it's quite often that a microcontroller is actually used with other microcontrollers or with some kind of a host computer, and uh, they have to communicate uh, with, uh, they have many, well, many communication protocols. RS-232 and 485 and 422 are actually very popular still in the automation industry, but also Ethernet, USB, I2C, SPI, uh, those are all uh, used as well. 
especially the I squared C and the SPI are communication protocols primarily used on the board itself for chip to chip communication. Uh, the microcontrollers, they're not really very fast, and it's not really important for them to be fast. What's most important is for them to be responsive. Uh, that is that when an interrupt from the outside world comes in, they have to be able to respond to that interrupt very, very quickly. Okay, so this is the block diagram of an STM32 F4 microcontroller. Uh, and these are all of the peripherals on here. This, my friends, is a system on a chip. Uh, it has flash memory, SRAM, 100 plus GPIO pins. Actually, I think there's more like 140. Uh, there's 17 multifunction timers that include PWMs, motor control, um, output compare, a whole, a whole mess of things that you can do with these timers. Uh, eight uh, UARTs, three I squared C ports, uh, three eight channel digital or analog to digital converters, two digital to analog converters, a USB 2.0 host device in on the go, Ethernet Mac, LCD TFT controller, and more. I haven't even finished going over all of the different peripherals on here. I maybe went through maybe 50 or 60 percent of them. There's still more stuff in here like random number generators, cryptography, hardware cryptography, CRC. There is a lot of stuff on one of these little chips. And I'll show you what one looks like. It's this big square right here. That's this microcontroller. It's very, very small, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. Okay, so a little bit about the Cortex family. Um, they mentioned in, in the announcement for DCOMP, they mentioned that I was going to give a talk on embedded systems. And I think that term, uh, ARM has, a, has a, a wealth of microcontrollers, and that term is getting almost redefined in a way. Uh, the Cortex-A microcontrollers are, are primarily used for tablets, smartphones, uh, these single board PCs like the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone Black, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, th those are embedded systems, but I wouldn't really necessarily call those embedded systems. I really think of them more as portable PCs. The uh, Cortex-R microcontroller, that's for the real serious stuff. Uh, they're uh, designed for hard real-time, reliability, redundancy. Um, I don't know much about these microcontrollers. I don't deal with them. The ARM Cortex-M are the ones that uh, I work with. And these are uh, kind of the catch-all, I would say. They're used for everything else, uh, white goods, home building automation, wearables, gadgets, gizmos, drones, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, whatever the hell you want to build. Uh, and they're particularly used for uh, low power devices. So uh, here we go. It's not the size of your executable, it's how you wiggle your bits. So here on these microcontrollers, the uh, less is more. Uh, ST Micro offers 398 ARM Cortex M uh, uh, microcontrollers. The smallest is 24 megahertz, 16 kilobytes of flash, and 4 kilobytes of SRAM. The largest is 180 megahertz, 2 megabytes of flash, 256 kilobytes of SRAM. Uh, there's not a lot of room on these things, especially look, look at the smallest one, 16 kilobytes of flash. So um, Adam Ruppe is going to give a talk tomorrow he, he, uh, on some bare metal stuff he's doing for um, the uh, x86 platform. He mentioned that he was able to get a binary down to th uh, 30 kilobytes. That's already twice the size of the smallest uh, MCU. So we've got to do a little bit better than that if we want to program these microcontrollers. And, uh, you know, there's just, there's just not a whole lot there. Uh, the ARM Cortex-M microcontroller has the uh, Thumb 2 instruction set. Actually, uh, the Thumb through a Thumb 2 instruction set. Uh, these two are, are uh, this is just Thumb only. Thumb is 16 bits. Thumb 2 is a combination of 16-bit and 32-bit instructions. Uh, you can see the, the Cortex-M0 all the way up here to the Cortex-M4. Uh, these particular instructions here in the pink are actually SIMD instructions for doing uh, digital signal processing. And then you see that the Cortex-M4 also has an FPU, so they have uh, floating point instructions as well. The hardware stack. So 
ARM actually doesn't make any, any silicon chips. They just make the architecture. And they distribute what they call the SimSys library with their, uh, for, their micro, for programming their microcontrollers. It stands for the, the Cortex, um, Cortex Microcontroller Standard Interface. What is it? Cortex Microcontroller Software Interface Standard. Uh, and then silicon vendors such as um, uh, Atmel, Freescale, uh, ST Micro, they actually make the chips, and they'll they'll take the core, uh, the ARM Cortex M core, and they'll combine it with a bunch of other peripherals, build their own peripheral library, and then and then send that to the board manufacturer. The board manufacturer is really where I work. Uh, we'll generate a custom PCB. Uh, we have additional, we'll add some additional uh, peripherals to that PCB, and then we'll add even um, more software on top of that. Uh, to make a board support package, and then uh, that's distributed to a product manufacturer where they make some new invention out of, out of uh, our hardware. So uses of microcontrollers, um, you know, you, you guys are probably already familiar with this. Uh, you know, printers, uh, all of the PC peripherals, you know, something in that, in that device has to control the motor. They have to receive inputs from the buttons, turn on the LEDs, uh, you know, put some display on the uh, liquid crystals displays. And then also white goods. For the same reason, they have to you know, process, they have to run the machine itself, uh, turn the motors, uh, read the temperature, um, accept input from the user, and again display uh, information in LEDs and liquid crystal displays. Um, this is an application, this is a product I worked on. I don't have a real picture of the machine. I, I actually don't think I, I can show you. Uh, but I want to des describe uh, how this works in general. This is uh, an application of using microcontrollers for in, uh, in the industrial automation sector. This is a color sorter. And the way it works is uh, it's used for filtering primarily like grains. So you put some rice up in at the top. And the rice has just came off the field. It might have some foreign matter in there. Uh, some of the kernels might be the wrong shape. They might be the wrong color. You want that nice, uniform grain that you can take to market. So it, it goes through this vibration feeder. It falls down uh, through the chute. These cameras actually take a picture of that falling rice as it's falling. It has a digital, sig digital signal processor inside the camera. It analyzes the image, figures out the, which kernels are the wrong shape, the wrong color, whatever, the location of those kernels, and it'll fall in front of this little ejector, this little air, uh, air gun, and it'll pssst, shoot it out, and it goes into the reject pile, and all the good stuff you know, comes down into this pile. Um, that was a really interesting machine to work on. I'm really glad I had that opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of microcontrollers in here uh, for controlling the lighting, um, uh, controlling the profile of the camera. Something has to tell the camera uh, what to look for. Uh, something has to uh, control the vibration of the feeder. There's a PID controller on the feeder to make sure that, you know, despite how much grain is being put on, onto that vibration feeder, it keeps a steady flow of grain uh, feeding the, uh, the system. The actual digital signal processing is not done uh, on a microcontroller. That's done on an FPGA but everything else is done in a microcontroller. There's also some fault tolerance in here and um, uh, the, a lot of sensors for reading temperature, um, uh, air pressure for the air gun to make sure everything's working. So if, if there is an error, uh, it can shut down gracefully. Uh, oh, I thought I'd remove that. Um, I tried to get some information about um, uh, how many microcontrollers are used in a car. I couldn't really get, a, get a, a direct answer. I got anywhere from you know, 30 on Wikipedia uh, up to uh, that first uh, citation there, which, which, which was really old. It claimed that in 2003, there would be over 200 microcontrollers in, a, in, a, in, a, in an automobile. I think probably around, around 100 is probably about right. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can make with these microcontrollers. This uh, particular company, Mace Tech, makes this little... Um, uh, LED, these LED shades, they actually, they're actually here in San Francisco. They were going to loan one to me for the decomp so I could put decomp on the front of it and wear it for this presentation. But actually, these are so popular, they're sold out. <laughs> so they, they couldn't give me one. Uh, I mention this because 
Uh, microcontrollers can used to be used to invent a lot of interesting machines. This is a solder reflow oven uh, made by a gentleman in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he also does a lot of development actually uh, in C++ for uh, microcontrollers. He had this very interesting machine. When, when you get into this field, you're eventually going to want to make your own board um, and, uh, you know, for your own device. The problem is, is you'll send... You'll, send your, you'll do your board schematic, you'll send it off to a, um, a PCB manufacturer, you'll get the PCB back, but you won't, it won't have any components on it. You've got to put all those components on there yourself. And if you've got 50 or 100 of these to do, these things are really small. You don't want to be sitting there soldering those, those things onto, a, onto the board. So you can use one of these solder reflow ovens. And what you do is you, you put a little bit of paste, solder paste on the PCB. You then place the components onto the PCB, put it in this oven, and it will cook it according to this particular uh, temperature profile and, uh, and solder it uh, so you have a nice board and you can just go drink coffee while it's doing that. Uh, and of course, I would love to make one of these bad boys, an unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, this is uh, one from 3D Robotics. Uh, it, it, is actually, it actually uses an, a Cortex-M4 microcontroller. Um, it, it's, it is indeed autonomous. You can give it like waypoint, way, waypoints and um, it uses GPS to actually atomic, uh, autonomously visit those waypoints. Uh, it's not just, a, just an RC um, uh, quadcopter. Um, so when, when you want to actually uh, start programming these, you're going to need some kind of a board. This is uh, some micro, a microcontroller board from Coaction. Uh, this was a successful um, a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it has an, an op a real-time operating system, as well as a couple of these peripherals. But it's a good example of the kind of, of uh, boards that you can buy. Uh, they'll, they'll put it, they'll, they can be used in these breadboards, so you can actually prototype your own circuits and make your own things. And you can see uh, his little example here. Uh, this uses a Cortex-M3 microcontroller. Uh, there's another company here that, uh, this, this one's in Europe, Microelectronica, and uh, they've got a huge selection of stuff for microcontrollers, including this board up here, 168 megahertz uh, Cortex-M4 board, uh, and, and then a whole list of peripherals, uh, RF communication, stepper motor control, gyro, for, you know, if you wanted to build your quadcopter. And then you can see this particular board here, this is also a, a Cortex-M4 microcontroller, doing pretty impressive 2D graphics, and it's only 168 megahertz. Uh, this is a product from Confile Technology for Industrial Automation. Uh, you can buy, uh, uh, this has a, a Cortex-M microcontroller in it, a Cortex-M3 actually, uh, and it has a bunch of modules uh, that you can uh, mix and match in order to create something for, uh, for your machine. Um, if you're not quite sure what a PLC is, you could probably go into the electrical closet uh, of any elevator and you'll probably see a mess of these things. So uh, these PLCs are, are quite used quite often in industrial automation. Um, how about programming languages? Uh, to date, um, the, the vast majority of, of programming is done in C, uh, probably because if you did it in C++, it would only appeal to of course, the C++ users. But if you do it in C, it appeals to both C++ and C users. So it'll never get out of this, this rut. It's always going to be in C. Uh, but there, is, there are people who do, who do uh, programming in C++. I prefer to do my programming in C++ as well. Uh, this is a product from Confile Technology. It's actually program, programmable in BASIC and something called ladder logic. I didn't know what ladder logic was until a, a few years ago. It's, uh, it, it, it looks like this ladder. They call these, these little lines rungs. And it has your inputs on your left and your outputs on your right. And uh, these little symbols in the middle are your operations in order to, to control the machine. Uh, you can use C Sharp and VB.net, actually, to program these microcontrollers uh, with the .NET micro framework. Uh, GHI Electronics uh, creates this product called the Gadgeteer. And what's really nice about this is you can use Visual Studio to program it with a debugger and everything. And it actually has a garbage collector. Uh, the garbage collector is not a generational garbage collector. It, uh, it's just a regular old mark and sweep. And a lot of people 
are using this successfully for some very interesting machines. Uh, then we have Java. This is a, an, an embedded Java virtual machine from, uh, what was it, e, uh, IS2T uh, technologies. And you can, they claim that uh, this particular uh, virtual machine only consumes 28 kilobytes of flash, 1.5 kilobytes of RAM. And you can see their demo of it here. It looks pretty impressive. OK, so to D, uh, how do we go about uh, porting D to these microcontrollers? Well, if my employer came to me and said, your salary depends on how quickly you can get this done, uh, I would probably choose this method. Uh, this, uh, this ports the D runtime actually to an operating system. And why would I choose this? Because the current ports for the D runtime are all to a particular operating system. Particularly, this operating system here, NUTX, is actually POSIX compliant. Uh, you could probably port this relatively easily to that operating system, I'm guessing. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's also this method. If you don't have an operating system, this would be more of a bare metal uh, port. Uh, you, but you'd actually still be building on top of the C library and the vendor's, um, the vendor's peripheral library. Um, I don't want to misrepresent this gentleman here. He, uh, he's doing a lot of great work uh, on these microcontrollers. He's the real pioneer, actually. I think it's just me and him, but he, he came far, far before me. Uh, he's, he's working on a product called uh, MinLibD, and I believe this is the, the approach that he is taking, although uh, I don't want to misrepresent his work. I, uh, I wish he could actually say a few words about this in, during this presentation. But my approach, okay? My approach is no C allowed. I, I want to try and use D exclusively. Uh, the D runtime would, would essentially replace uh, the C library here. It'd just be a minimal, a very minimal runtime, not the full thing. I just want enough of the D runtime to be able to implement these two things, memory mapped I.O. and the peripheral library. And then potentially after that's done, I could build an RTOS in, in D with, uh, with threading and, and all the other nice features, and then build a D runtime on top of that RTOS. But really right now, it's this that I'm focusing on right here. So why do things the hard way? Uh, mixing languages is inconvenient. I don't want to have to be switching back between D and C, you know, doing all of my low-level hardware, our hardware uh, uh, programming in C, and then doing all the high-level stuff in, in D. That, that just doesn't appeal to me. I think it gives D an opportunity, if, if, if this is successful, to, to show that it can stand on its own. Uh, right now, I, don't see, I haven't seen any implementation of D where it's just D. It's always built on, on either an operating system or a C library. And I'd like to see, can D actually just do everything? Um, I think it puts D in an unusual territory, and if I'm successful at doing this, I think it would be an exemplary, an exemplary project for D. Uh, and these are more, uh, more personal. Um, I've only been doing this for a couple of years. I'd like to uh, you know, improve my skills as an embedded systems programmer, and I think taking, an, taking on an, uh, a project like this would really exercise my own skills and really challenge me, and I'd be able to produce something... Um, uh, really significant and and uh, really improve my skills as an embedded developer. Uh, most of the projects that I that I, I found useful when I was in college were projects like that where I had I had to implement the ext2 file system. I had to write a uh, multitasking operating system in C, and those two projects really improved my skills as a as a software engineer. Um, finally, the last the last reason is I get to do things my way. Uh, I find that sometimes. Uh, the, the hardest part about writing software is trying to learn someone else's API the way they thought about it. Well, I kind of want to build it my way. I want to do it the way I think about it. Okay, so some goals. Of course, we want to make it possible for people to program the ARM Cortex-M microcontroller in D. Uh, we want to be able to create a a minimal implementation of D that's kind of a suitable alternative for C, but would have all of these uh, really nice features that C doesn't have. CTFE, uh, templates, mixins, and, and whatever else is there. 
but it would have to be minimal, uh, something that there'd be no garbage collector. Um, you might have a dynamic memory allocation, but no uh, exceptions either. Something, you know, C-like in a way. Um, my, also, my intention is to document the, the implementation thoroughly. Um, I think uh, D lacks a lot of documentation uh, specifically about the runtime, and it's kind of a mystery. And I think going through this, this, uh, this process and, and documenting uh, what I'm doing thoroughly might help demystify the runtime itself and, uh, and uh, make it more accessible to other people. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, as I mentioned, ST Micro has 398 uh, of these processors, and that's just one, that's just one manufacturer. There's also Freescale, Atmel, um, and a number of, of other manufacturers. There is no way one person is going to write all of the code necessary to support all of these microcontrollers. Uh, so it's going to have to be divided up. So I'm hoping uh, we'll attract some contributors uh, that will, uh, you know, help uh, build some of the peripheral libraries for these, for this, uh, these microcontrollers in D. And then, of course, finally, make something cool. I mean, how cool would it be to have a quadcopter that's programmed in D and have it, you know, flying around here in the room uh, with for the live feed or something? I don't know. Okay. And my philosophy. Well, I like this quote. A designer know he knows he has achieved perfection not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Um, I'm trying to keep things as minimal as possible. Okay, so the compilers. Um, I got started, my first uh, program, or when I, when I, when I started uh, building this software, I tried to use GDC, but I couldn't get GDC to build. There was something wrong with my, my Linux computer. I didn't have some, uh, some DLL in the right place or whatever. I couldn't get it to build. So I started using uh, LDC. I built it with the ARM thumb back end. And, and it worked. It worked fine. Uh, I had to use the no runtime switch, however, which has recently been removed. Um, so I don't know if I, I would be successful again. Um, and it's my understanding, I had to use a G, a GNU, the GNU LD linker because it's my understanding uh, LLVM doesn't have a linker. Is that right? It has to use the native linker. Does anybody know about that? Yeah, okay, so uh, um, I, I downloaded the GNU linker from, uh, the, uh, from uh, one of the uh, uh, ARM's open source uh, providers. They have a nice uh, compiler. That it's all already built and everything, and I just pulled the linker out of there and used it. Um, I ran into some problems, however, <clears throat> using this compiler, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so I haven't done any testing since, uh, since January. How about GDC? Well, you have to build a cross-compiler. Now, I had some trouble with this, but I finally figured out what I needed to do, and I, I uh, put together some instructions on, on the D-Wiki that describes how to build a microcontroller for this particular platform, the ARM NUN EABI. Uh, and currently, it's the compiler of choice for uh, all of the work that I'm doing. I hope to be able to go back to LDC. They did fix LDC. The LDC folks fixed a couple of bugs for me. Um, I'd like to get back to it and test those, uh, but I haven't been able to. What about DND? Well, this is kind of a question for Walter. Uh, they, Intel has released the, a Quark uh, MCU uh, with the Galileo board. It's kind of like a, a Raspberry Pi kind of thing. Uh, but it's built uh, using uh, a Pentium instruction set. So I'm wondering, could DND program this board? So is it actually Penti the Pentium instruction set or some variant of it? You're seeing all the information I know. <laughs> well, because I know that the back end can generate straight Pentium code. OK. Including uh, the, the pipelining, the UV pipelines and stuff like that. It's actually very good at doing the UV pipeline and scheduling and stuff like that. So based on what I am seeing there, yes. Okay, cool. Well, that would be cool if, uh, if someone could get their hands on a board and maybe uh, test that out. Well, I'd be uh, very interested in that. And if somebody does get a board and want to test it out, we can maybe work out doing a minimal, minimal D runtime to support it. Killer. Okay, so what tools do you need to program these microcontrollers? Well, of course, you need the, the typical tools for writing any software, the editor, the compiler, and the linker. Uh, but this is a, um, 
you know, the, the board is external to your development to, uh, machine, so uh, you have to have some way to communicate with it. Um, I'm going to talk, there's, there's a lot of commercial tools that are out there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it, you know, to the things that are accessible to everybody. Uh, the, there's a, a GDB server called OpenOCD, uh, the Open On Chip Debugger. It, it runs on the host machine and it has all the drivers for, for one of these uh, in-circuit emulators. Uh, this in-circuit emulator just takes information over, the, over USB, translates it to JTAG or SWI, uh, something the board can understand. And you can do, in GDB, the GDB client connects to the GDB server uh, as a remote uh, TCPI connection. And so then you can download things to the board, you can set breakpoints, you can do the whole works. Um, I don't use, really use the, the, G, the debugger very often, uh, but I have used it a little bit. Uh, and, 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 and in its current state with D, it worked for a few things. I didn't have any trouble with it. I was just inspecting memory and whatnot, though. Okay, and then people are actually, someone made an interesting project. This is a, uh, a black magic probe. I have one right here. That's how small it is, very miniature device. This has an ARM Cortex-M uh, microcontroller on it. This actually runs a GDB server. Uh, he actually ported the GDB, to the GDB server to this particular chip. And it, uh, you, don't, you don't need a GDB server running on the host machine anymore. You just connect it via USB. It shows up as a virtual COM port on the host PC. And then you just attach to it from your GDB client uh, to the, the COM port. And you can do all of your debugging and whatnot uh, to your board. Very cool. OK. Um, I wanted to, in order to get, start, get started programming this, I wanted to build something very simple, uh, you know, very, very minimal. The typical implementation is to uh, implement a Blinky application. The Blinky application is where you have an LED connected to one of your GPIO pins, and you blink it at some, some you know, 500 milliseconds, every 500 milliseconds or something. Well, there are two problems with this. The board that I'm using doesn't have an LED. <laughs> Uh, the second problem is, in order to do that, you actually have to write, uh, manipulate some of the memory mapped I.O. registers. And I don't have any code yet for manipulating memory mapped I.O. registers. I'm starting with nothing. So I wanted to do something else. I, uh, ARM has uh, this technology called semi-hosting. Semi-hosting is where you, uh, you can actually do file I.O. through this... Uh, this in-circuit emulator, and it will actually print things, or you can, you can read, you can, you can do it both ways, but in this example, I'm just writing and displaying something to standard error, and it shows up on the host PC. Every time you do a printout, you know, every time you write to standard error, it'll show up whatever text is on the host PC. And we'll look at the code here in a second. It looks like this. It requires a assembly, inline assembly. Now, my rule is no, you know, to do everything in D, but uh, I consider inline assembly D, so I'm not cheating, <laughs> all right? So uh, the way this works, it reminds me when I did some programming for the, the x86 processor, um, I would do, uh, I, I had to do these, uh, these, inter these uh, software interrupts, like interrupt 13 in order to read from a disk. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with that. These BIOS interrupt routines, it seems to work a little bit like that. You load some information into, into uh, the registers, and then you, you, you do this software interrupt with this uh, breakpoint instruction, and that uh, uh, tells whatever peripheral is on the chip to send the information up to the host PC. This was really simple, a really low barrier to entry kind of a program. I really liked this. I was really satisfied with it. Um, and this is the entire program. It, well, missing one thing. Um, in order to get this to build with GDC, you actually have to have an empty object.d file with uh, a module object semicolon up at the top. But that's all you need in this, and it'll, it'll build, and you can download it to your board, and it'll run and print Hello World uh, on your host PC. These are the, uh, the compiler flags that are needed. Um, I understand that the F no emit module info is the same as the better C switch in, um, in DMD. Um, but you also have to compile with these other things, F function sections and F data sections. Um, what these do is uh, the F function sections will put each function into its own section. Uh, 
uh, so that if that function is not used, it can be garbage collected by the linker. We'll look at that in a second. So part of the linking process, you have to actually create your own linker script. Uh, well, you know, when it generated the executable, it doesn't know how to arrange that stuff in memory. You have to tell it how to arrange this executable in memory. This is a very, very simple example uh, uh, for the, the simple hello world. It's not a complete linker script. Uh, you have to write, you know, a lot of other stuff in here if you want to make a complete linker script for, for these boards. Uh, but basically, the entry point is really here. It's going to read... The, the, very, the very first word it reads is the stack start, uh, the very first uh, word in the text section. When the, when the processor boots up, it, 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 lo it loads that, uh, that value as the initial stack pointer. And then the second word that it reads is the pointer to the reset handler, which is uh, the entry point to the, uh, to the software. And if, uh, if we go back... Uh, that's this, this on reset. You can see I, I, I had to make a pointer up at the top of the reset handler points down here to, to uh, on reset. And uh, there it is, the reset handler. That's where the entry point is. And, uh, and then we have to include the read-only data as well uh, for the actual hello world string constant. Okay. And this is what it looks like. Beautiful. Uh, and I wanted to see how small of an executable I can make. So if I turn on the optimization flags to try to get it as small as possible, I end up with a 56-byte hello world. That's nice. That's going to fit quite comfortably in 16 kilobytes of RAM. And that's, that's due to, these, to the, GC, the GC sections in the linker. Let me go back right here. Remember, uh, we, we put each function into its own section. Uh, if you add GC section, it strips out all the stuff that you're not using, and so you're able to get it down to something uh, really small. Okay, <laughs> this is funny. Is Ian here? Oh, Ian's not here. This is, uh, I posted this on the forum, and Ian said, that's not D, that's some D, a bit of some extended inline assembly, and a custom linker script. Ouch. <laughs> well, truth hurts, though. He's absolutely right. That's not D. I mean, you know, if you look at that, that program, it might even work on a C compiler, for crying out loud. Okay, but... Then David Nadlinger came on and rescued my pride and said, that's some nice progress indeed. Would you mind transferring your, ex your excellent description of the process to the D-Wiki? So I did. I posted on the D-Wiki. Uh, to date, I checked it earlier this morning. Um, it has, that particular example has 2,200 uh, views on it since, since I posted it, a, 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 was it five months ago or six months ago? So I'm guessing that there's some interest in this based on that. So what's the purpose of the Hello World program? Well, the reason I wrote it was for, for two reasons. One is to verify that all the, t the tool chain works. Uh, I, I, I didn't know. I, I, my very first post to the forum was, is it possible to build a, you know, to make a working executable for this platform? I, I, it ended up turning into a debate about volatile. I, I never even really got an answer. So... Uh, <laughs> So I, I just decided to try it. So, and, and so uh, I, I wanted to verify that the compiler could actually generate a working executable, and, and it worked. And so I was, very, I was very satisfied. The second reason for the Hello World program is to give an, a place to start, a, a place to begin your development. And, and now we have that. And so I'm hoping that, that this will, anybody else who wants to maybe program a microcontroller uh, but doesn't know exactly where to start, this would be a good place. Um, interrupt handlers. There's two things you have to do when programming these, these microcontrollers. Um, I don't have enough time. Um, uh, one of them is to respond to interrupts, and the other is to manipulate memory mapped I.O. So if you remember... Uh, that very first, that very second word uh, was a reset handler. Actually, that was kind of a, a cheat. I just wanted something to work. Uh, really, what you put there is the, the ISR vector table. There's a huge vector table. For this particular processor, it's actually 97 different uh, vector interrupts. I've implemented it in D right here. I didn't implement the whole thing, of course. It doesn't fit on the screen. Uh, but you can see I, I, I have some extern uh, um, function pointers that, or functions that need to be implemented by the user 
you, they can leave it blank. They could put a, a, a while loop in there to, to just spin and run. And then load, I load those into the ISR vector table, and, and then that gets put into the correct place in the linker. Um, actually, the way this is done in C is they use weak references, but we don't have weak references um, in the GDC compiler. And I'm not necessarily sure I want to advocate for it. I kind of like uh, a method like this where it's just portable decode instead. Uh, this is the user, what the user module might look like. It, it just implements those individual uh, functions. Uh, program initial, initialization. So if you actually want to use, have any program state, now we don't have, this is all very basic. We don't have threads, so we don't have thread local storage. We just want regular C-like global variables. Uh, some, I have some examples here of, of these uh, global variables and, and where they actually get put into the linker or put in, uh, which section they get put into. Um, when, when you download this, uh, the executable to your board, it's going to be put in flash memory, uh, including all of, the, all of the initial values for your data section. Well, that flash memory for the, for the, the purpose of the program is read-only memory. So we have to have some way to pull it out of read-only memory and put it into RAM. And so you, you do that with the, with the linker script. Part of it here is in the linker script. Uh, we have to have a, uh, identify where our, where our sections start and end. And then in the program, we have to copy that data out of flash memory into RAM and initialize the BSS segment to zero. And then we, we call system in it, and that, that's where we call main. And, uh, and, or we initialize our hardware, and then we call main. OK, now um, I, uh, I had, OK, so I have a basic, the ability to, uh, to make a working executable. It's very, very basic. But I want to be able to add structs. So I decided to add a simple struct to my source code. And uh, just with like, you know, struct my struct, and then int x equals 1 or something like that. And I get this, OK? Uh, can't find type info struct. Uh, object D is corrupt. Uh, and I started, I started implementing all of this stuff in object.d trying to get it to compile. Uh, you know, because uh, when, you, when you implement the type info, that type, all the code in that type info calls something else, and that code calls something else. And it just started snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. And the sad thing is my GC sections is just going to strip all that stuff out anyway. So um, I found a little hack. If I do this, it tricks the compiler into thinking, uh, you know, it just says, you know, basically ignore what's there. And this is working very well for me. <laughs> uh, so this is my solution at the moment. Uh, and I'm able to continue uh, working on my project. Um, I'd like to have a solution to this. Uh, I think Adam Ruppe uh, um, uh, mentioned a solution to move the type info to the D runtime. And uh, that's issue. I, I went and posted it into the D wiki as, or the, the tracker as an, as an enhancement because I think this might help with that problem. OK, so we want to do memory mapped I.O. So this is how I did my memory mapped I.O. Um, I, I really like this article by Ken Smith, the Register Access Redux. You can look for it online if you're interested. Um, it's, a, it's a C++ templates policy-based design. It's very different from the typical C approach. It actually enforces the mutability of the register. So uh, read-only read registers uh, uh, can, are, are verified at compile time. If you try to write to it, it's going to give you a compile time error. And it, it also allows very easy cross-referencing to the data sheet, which, uh, which the, the typical C implementation does not. And the, the interesting thing is after it's built, you know, he showed an example, it generates exactly the, the exact same binary, even though it's in C++, it's the exact same binary as C code. Um, so what about the data sheet? This is the data sheet for the STM32 F4 microprocessor that I have to use. And if you look right here, this thing is 1,700 pages of some of the worst reading your eyes will ever see. And if you can, you can get through part of it with your sanity intact, what you really need are these register uh, tables. They, they tell you the location of all the registers in the chip and uh, all the bit fields that, uh, and what they do. And there's thousands of these things in there. You know, I just mentioned some of the peripherals. You have a register bank like this for every peripheral. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff. Oh, uh, so this is my cue. I want to show something. 
So I want to show what my code looks like before I, I discuss its implementation. This is what my code looks like in order to manipulate my memory mapped I.O. registers. And the real nice thing about it is due to the DCD plugin, I believe Brian, or the DC, the, the D completion daemon from Brian shot, um, I, I'm able to get a list of all of my, my, um, my bit fields inside of my registers. And if I were uh, to choose one of them and put my mouse over it, I've got my ddoc too. So what, what this means is my code is my data sheet. I don't have to go and, and uh, you know, read that hu humongous uh, manual anymore. And, and if you want to see what the, the code looks like in C, or do I, do I have it? Yeah, I do. This is what the, that looks like in C. I mean, how, how is anyone supposed to be able to, at a glance, you know, understand what that's doing? That's uh, ridiculous. Uh, you know, this is much more, this is much more obvious. And uh, I actually have the ability to set multiple values simultaneously. So this will result in one read, read modify, write uh, of that register because those bit fields are in one register. So using this, the, this feature of D, um, the, the, I think it was a mix-in. I can't remember how I implemented that, but um, I'm able to actually um, set multiple bit fields at once to save myself code, uh, code space and time. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to go over the implementation a little bit here. Um, I have, uh, if you look at the data sheet, it tells the address offset. Uh, it tells the kind of access. Uh, some registers can only be accessed by words. Some can be accessed by words, half words, and bytes. Um, and then some bit fields are read, read only, some are write, read write, and there's actually a number of other uh, mutability um, constraints. So if we look at those, this, these are them out of the data sheet. They're very interesting. You can see here, RC underscore W1 software can read as well as clear this bit by writing a one. So you write a one in order to make it zero. Uh, so really, uh, I, I want to I be able to convert that. I want to be able to read that at compile time and just set that into, a, into a, like a clear method, for example. Uh, so I, I modeled it as an enum. And I'm able to, to then at compile time look at these, uh, read these uh, methods in order to be able to, to get the kind of uh, the mutability requirements for my, my given register. And I'm able to do, to model the, um, the access, the byte access. And I'm also able to model um, another feature. I hope, I hope you're keeping this all in mind. I'm going to I'm going to put it all together in a minute. Um, the, the ARM has something called bit banding. Bit banding is, is an alias region of memory where each individual uh, bit can be accessed by a 32-bit address. And so what's nice about this, of course, is you can do atomic operations on bits uh, just by writing to that or reading and writing from, uh, from that memory location. Uh, I actually use this method inside of my memory mapped I.O. library to avoid the read, modify, write. Uh, not necessarily needing it for you know, um, synchronization or anything like that. Or I just want to be able to reduce the, the number of instructions that I, I generate with my code. So data sheet to code. This is what it looks like when you use the, uh, when, you, when you model a register. Uh, let's look at this particular one here, PLLQ. Uh, 27 to 4, mutability is read, write. You can see up there the four fields. Actually, they're actually used as one field, not, not four. Uh, it has a mutability of read, write. Um, I've modeled my, my access according to that register. This is so easy to go back and forth to the data sheet. I've actually automated this. I cut and paste this out of the PDF file, put it into a, a, a C Sharp program, because I'm familiar with C Sharp, and it generates this code for me. So uh, that's going to really help me uh, accelerate my ability to model all of these registers in D. And, and it's very easy to check. You know, if, you get, if you get any of, any of these bits wrong, uh, you're going to have an error. And you're not going to know where it is. And you've got to go and you've got to verify this back to the data sheet. 
and make sure and, and check where your error is. And so it's really nice to be able to, to uh, have that cross-referencing back to the data sheet. Um, given that information, you know, we, we have our, our bid indexes. And you can do this 2724 or 2427, doesn't matter. And I'm able to get the most significant bid index, the least significant bid index, the number of bits, all of this stuff at compile time. Um, I'm able to check is uh, the alignment uh, given the access uh, enum. Uh, and, and then I'm able at compile time to generate an appropriate value property that, 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 uh, where, where all of the mutability and the access and everything is enforced at compile time. So it checks to see, well, can you read? Is this, can, you, can I read this register? Um, uh, if so, uh, generate a value. Uh, is it bit bandable? In other words, can I, can I address it with a 32-bit or 32-bit address? Um, see what else we have here. Uh, and and it, cho it just chooses the appropriate uh, uh, implementation to optimize the access. So, for example, if it's, if it's, if it's 15, if, it's a, if the bit field is 15 to 8 and, it, and it's addressable or it's accessible uh, with a byte address, it's byte addressable, um, I can actually reduce the number of instructions to access that field by just accessing that byte alone because it's only, it's exactly 8 bits. And so it'll, it'll reduce the number of instructions that I create. It, it, will, it will make an unaligned access, and I haven't tested if that's going to be a problem yet. But, you know, I, just, I was just having fun with this implementation. Uh, this is the same thing for, uh, for a writable value. And I have, to, I have to point out this particular thing here, shared. I'm using this as volatile. When I, when I looked at the, the source code that GDC generates, I can see that, uh, uh, that it, it seems to almost replace shared with volatile. It's the only way I could figure out to do what I wanted to do uh, and, and have volatile access. So uh, this is the implementation I chose. The problem is I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that this is a, uh, a GDC implementation detail and, and may not be portable maybe for other, other things. Uh, but, uh, but from what I understand, the, the sh shared is not actually uh, well-defined. Yes? Um, just so you know, uh Shared being mapped to volatile is actually a bug. Um, that's the only way currently that I can force uh, GCC uh, to not put uh, shared data in registers. Okay. Uh, there is another way to go about it, and that's to set it as addressable. Uh, however, that breaks a lot of code because... Um, it's mostly in terms of uh, the GDC code gen. It does create a lot of temporaries. And if you're creating temporaries to addressable data, uh, oh, no, to, to uh, data whose types are marked as addressable, it doesn't like this. OK. All right, well, I'll have to address that, I guess. OK, so uh, in my implementation, then, uh, this was the, the assembly it generated. Um, if you see bits 1 to 0, um, it, it falls on a byte on a byte boundary, but it, it it's not exactly one byte, so it can't do the the actual. Uh, it has to do a read modify write. So it uh, you can see it generates uh, uh, six instructions, total of 18 bytes. You can see the thumb instructions here. It's kind of weird. Um, it's a mixture of 32-bit instructions and 16-bit instructions. However, if I do uh, an access like this, bits 15 to 8, that's exactly, uh, exactly 8 bits. It falls exactly on a byte boundary. And I don't have to do a read, modify, write. I can just go right to that particular uh, address. That saves me a few instructions and uh, a little bit of, or saves me one instruction, right? Yeah, one instruction and a few bytes. It's a micro-optimization, I know, but it was fun. Um, actually, uh, I, I did a comparison to see uh, how this might uh, impact the speed. This is a, where I'm, I'm using the, the standard C library from, from ST's uh, peripheral library. I can wiggle a bit at uh, 3 megahertz approximately using their library. But because, um, I, uh, because of the, my implementation in D and being able to avoid a certain read and write or read modify write cycles, and just read a, a particular uh, bit or a particular byte uh, with one 
uh, with one read or one write, um, I'm actually able to wiggle that bit at 20 megahertz. So, um, and you can see that it wasn't, it's kind of an ugly curve because of the capacitance in my setup. It didn't even give it enough time for the voltage to ramp up. So, now is, is that really, is that really significant? Oh, where, what's going on here? Okay, is that really, jeez. Is that really significant? I would say it's significant in one, one part, and that is in your interrupt handlers where you want to be able to reduce the latency. An interrupt came in. You have to be able to check uh, what caused that interrupt. That's usually a bit field. Uh, you have to be able to clear that bit that's writing a bit, um, uh, writing to, that uh, to a particular bit field. And if you can do that without read, modify, writes to 32-bit instructions, you can reduce your latency of your interrupt handler. So uh, maybe it might be useful. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to make a few concessions here. Memory mapped I.O. likely makes up a small percentage of your application. So you know, like I said, these are probably micro-optimizations. But it was so fun and so simple to do in D, and it was a real nice exercise. I think I might continue to use it. Uh, now, I have to make this concession. There is no utility in using 100% of your CPU to vibrate one of your 144 pins at 20 megahertz, right? Uh, that was totally ridiculous. But as, as I mentioned, in, maybe in an interrupt handler where you can reduce your latency, that might be useful. Um, what, what was the real exercise of this? I, I, was, I was exploring D. And what I, what I found out is that I don't see anything in D that will prevent me from fully util, utilizing my hardware. And that was important for me. Um, I, I didn't want to have to have. I didn't want to have to compromise uh, anything, and I actually think I got more uh, out of this using D. Um, I, I already showed you the code completion from uh, Brian's uh, D completion daemon, so I'll go ahead and skip this. I think we're running out of time anyway. Uh, okay, so some other experiments. Uh, I'm currently working on trying to get module info to work and, and uh, implement static constructors. I think this might be useful for my hardware because in those static constructors, I might be able to maybe do my initialization routines or something of that nature. Um, I'm trying to get this worked out. Um, I also made a, uh, just for, just to, to, to see what I could do with classes, I implemented a first fit malloc in D and I, um, I was able to create a new class by, by calling malloc inside that dnew class runtime hook and then freeing it with destroy. So I, I suppose potentially, I haven't tested this thoroughly, um, I'm on the, the cups of being able to use classes in, 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 uh, in this implementation. Near future plans, um, I want to finish this, the STM32 peripheral library, uh, map all those, all those I.O. registers and, and expose those to my program. Um, I want to implement a few more basic features of D, as I mentioned, module info, uh, runtime initialization, and static constructors. Um, and I hope after I do that, I'll actually be able to make something kind of cool in, in D. And so I'm, I hope I can make some exemplary uh, demonstration that I could post on Announce, and you know, uh, it might serve as a kind of a, a new thing. Uh, and I need, I've kind of, uh, it was a quite stressful last couple of months trying to prepare for this uh, D conference, and I had to actually finish a product at work before they would give me leave to come here. So I've, I've slacked on a lot of things, and uh, I want to get back to documenting uh, what I've done so far uh, on my wiki. My wiki currently has about uh, five uh, articles that I wrote that kind of describes uh, basically everything I discussed so far. For our future plans, I hope to create an RTOS in D and then maybe port the D runtime to that RTOS. Uh, it, you know, it seems like the D runtime is really built to run on an operating system, so I think it would be nice to just you know, build that operating system and then port the D runtime to that. And that's it. Thank you. I think we should take time for questions if we have any. Over there. Uh, you have mentioned that you rely heavily on LD collecting the new sections uh, via uh, separating segments for data and functions. Um, it's interesting because I have tried the same just with not as the microcontrollers, just with the plain GDC. 
and have found that for any of more advanced applications, it actually breaks binaries. And I believe Walter had the same issues when trying some approach for DMD. Mm, do you have any insight of what could have been wrong here? Um, I, I don't. Um, there, if you use if you use GC sections, um, um, there are some things. Uh, well, if you're doing the bare metal programming, there are some things that uh, that there isn't any link to. So, for example, my reset handler, you in my linker script, you'll see that I marked it. I don't know if I can go back. In my linker script, I marked it as keep, uh, and that that actually prevents GC sections from stripping that out. Um, but uh, um, I, I did run into a problem before, like you said, but I wasn't able to figure out what the problem was, uh, and it went away. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it went away, and I, wasn't I was never able to figure it out. So I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Uh, I might admit one thing to this is like specifically problem with GDC and DMD is like uh, erasing the exception handlers table because they're not referenced anywhere directly. Right, that's what, that's what I meant. You have to mark them as keep in, yeah. your, in your linker script. So if I can get back to there. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely like to thank you for this work. It's amazing. Um, thank you. Because uh, whenever you have to work on something like that, the vendor, hardware vendor provided libraries are like crap. Kind yeah, of. right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a real pain. Yeah. They're not type safe. They yeah. require a whole lot of boilerplate. Right. So like six months ago, I was like writing such code and I was like hoping there should be a better solution. It looks really great. Really yeah. Promising. I, I share your concern. Yeah. Uh, here's, the, here's the part of the linker script. I had to mark my vector table as keep, otherwise garbage.